Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And Aloha America. Welcome to our show today. It is Monday, August 22nd, 2016, getting on through the month, heading into autumn, a week away from my birthday. And uh, did you know I share the same birthday as Michael Jackson, the pop star? Which kind of blows that whole astrology thing out the window because I can't dance and I'm not into little boys. Anyway, we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. And unfortunately, uh, due the, to the actions of uh, Vonage, our toll-free number is once again inactive. So if you want to call into the show today, you're going to have to call area code 512-716-1523. 1523. One more time for those of you a little slow getting your pencils. 512-716-1523. And you'll reach Mike in our control room, who will put you on the air, and peace and harmony will reign in the galaxy. Now then, <clears throat> one of the things in this final rush toward the November election that we have to be on guard about is fraud and hoaxes. And somebody is going around setting up totally bogus fake corporate media websites and using them to try and plant stories on the independent media to make us look silly. And the latest one was a recreation of an ABC News page that carried the banner headline, Obama signs executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide. And you need to check those URLs very, very carefully. They're usually some permutation of the real ABC News URL, but anybody can register any URL if it's not already taken. And we have to be very, very vigilant. We had one about a week ago where they were out there with this live poll, and it was uh, masking as an uh, ABC News site. It's now been taken down. It was actually being run on GoDaddy. So we need to be very, very vigilant because somebody is trying to trip us up and make us look untrustworthy as we get closer and closer to November. So please really check the veracity of the URL. Make sure you're looking at a genuine corporate media website before you post a story anywhere because somebody is out there trying to cause a great deal of mischief. Now, for those of you who've been wondering about Ron Gibson, Ron Gibson is this gentleman. He's got a YouTube channel on which he archives videos from this show, from Alex Jones and a bunch of others, and he stopped... uh, Uh, several days ago, and a lot of people were very worried about him. We couldn't get an email. We just got an update. We posted a video. He had to go into the hospital for some surgery, but he's doing fine, and he's going to be back uh, building his archives back up again. So we wish Ron get well, and we're glad that that's all it was, given how many people who are a part of the truth movement seem to be having serious accidents these days. Now, down in Louisiana... As you know, the governor of Louisiana originally tried to dismiss Donald Trump's uh, visit down there by saying, well, he's, he's just coming for a photo op. But Donald Trump, when he went down to Louisiana, did not take his own media people. Now, the corporate media followed him along, hoping to find something they could use to embarrass him. Uh, but he was just down there helping out, bringing attention to the situation. He took an 18-wheeler truck full of supplies down there to hand on out didn't make a big deal about that either didn't need to it's all over social media and so now the democratic governor of louisiana has done an about face and said yes it was a help for donald trump to come down there he brought a lot of attention to the suffering that's going on down there donations are pouring on in programs are stepping in to help meanwhile of course obama was up there playing golf on martha's vineyard And Hillary Clinton took a moment out from her very busy career schmoozing ultra-wealthy donors to send a tweet of support. Now, one thing that the Obama White House did send down to Louisiana was a warning not to be racist during your Reconstruction the way you were after Katrina. (laughs) Needless to say, this rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Obama is suffering from a bad case of hoof in mouth or foot in mouth, if you want. And so Obama finally realized he's got to mend some bridges, and he's out there saying, okay, 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 I'll go down to Louisiana tomorrow. There, are you happy? Petulant little individual there. Now, a lot of attention is starting to focus on Julian Assange and what may be an effort to try and finally silence him. Now, the first thing had to do with his lawyer 
who supposedly was struck by a train, immediately declared suicide non-suspicious. The Queen's Court came on out with an announcement saying that they didn't think it was a suicide. That, of course, provoked a huge, huge firestorm. And so the Queen's Court came on back and backpedaled and said, well, we just weren't sure that his mental condition was such that he could decide whether or not he wanted to commit suicide before he flung himself in front of the train. I mean, they're really reaching on this one. Nobody has talked to the uh, uh, engineers. Nobody in the media has talked to the engineers about what they saw. And remember, Great Britain has the highest per capita concentration of surveillance cameras of any country on Earth. No video. Complete blackout on this. Now, this lawyer was the head of the team that was working to block the U.S. extradition request from Ecuador. And so this was definitely a strike uh, at the team that's trying to protect him, possibly a warning to the other lawyers. And then we had this story that broke earlier today where security at Ecuador's embassy, where Julian Assange has been living for years now, somebody tried to break in. They, climbing up the outside, was discovered by security and made his escape, so we don't know who it was. But the implication here that, that this guy may have been trying to assassinate Julian Assange. Now, I don't know what good that would do because Julian Assange is the figurehead of a rather large organization, which I would expect would react with fury at the assassination of their, their leader, the way Breitbart News did. When Breitbart himself was killed, Breitbart News just, they were energized and went after this. On the other hand, if Julian Assange or any of his people who are listening to this broadcast, my recommendation is if you've got something on Hillary Clinton that is worth being killed over, put it out now. Because assassinating you to prevent the release is one thing. Assassinating you just for revenge, that's a very different equation. So you want... To get that out. So anyway, this unknown man scaled the sidewall and window of the embassy at 2.47 in the morning. And security detected him and he made good his escape. If the Hillary campaign is taking desperate chances like this, you know they are absolutely terrified of what may still be coming on out. Now, last week, Hillary Clinton tried to dump that whole private email server nonsense on Colin Powell. And she said in her FBI interview, as part of the investigation into the email server, testifying not under oath, no transcript, no recording, just the FBI's recollection of what she said, she claimed that she had been told by Colin Powell that it was okay to use a private email server for non-classified emails. Powell has now responded, saying that he's got no recollection of any of this going on, which is basically a very diplomatic way of saying Hillary Clinton lied because Colin Powell doesn't want to die suddenly and mysteriously. But Powell then came on out and said Hillary's people are trying to pin this on him because he did send a memo regarding the use of a private email server for non-classified information, but he didn't send it until a year after Hillary Clinton started using her private server. And certainly, we know that Hillary Clinton had classified information on that server classified at the moment of creation my question is was she selling this material to foreign governments in exchange for donations to her foundation it's the obvious conclusion of where this is all going easy means of delivering secrets easy means of collecting and laundering the payments it's a perfect setup for espionage and nobody wants to touch that question apparently the fbi has apparently found a total of fifteen thousand more clinton documents on her server that were not turned over to the state department and they're turning them over now, and the State Department's hemming and hawing. Judicial Watch wants copies of them. And it's just heating up. And if the corporate media was actually doing their job, this would be headline news all over. But the headline news on the corporate media is, oh, Trump went to Louisiana just to grandstand. He's just, he's just exploiting those poor people who lost their homes, you know. <clears throat> Now, Judicial Watch released some additional emails, State Department documents, including an email exchange in which Hillary Clinton's top aide, Huma Abedin, 
provided influential Clinton Foundation donors special expedited access to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. In many instances, the preferential treatment provided to donors was at the specific request of Clinton Foundation Executive Douglas Band. There it is, the pay-for-play scandal. That's illegal. It's corrupt. Where's the corporate media on this? This is the smoking gun. Now then. Interesting article came out of uh, Telesurf TV. Hillary Clinton, the anti-woman feminist. And they're talking about how Hillary is continuing to pander to the female voter, trying to lure them all in. I'll save you from those evil, smelly, stinky males. And unfortunately, there's a possible backfire. First of all, we all know how Hillary Clinton herself personally treats women. Women on her staff are paid about three quarters of what the men on Hillary's staff are being paid. So much for equality. We know how Hillary literally savaged all of Bill Clinton's sexual assault victims. And beyond that, there's a very subtle message going on out there. Remember back in the 1990s when the militant feminists were always going on about, oh, those men, they think with their genitalia, they never use their brains. And here you have Hillary Clinton basically assuming women are going to do exactly the same, that women are going to vote for Hillary Clinton on the basis of genitalia rather than actually thinking things through. And I think any women who see themselves as feminists are going to look at this and realize they're being cheaply stereotyped in a very, very bad way. So my message to women out there is prove Hillary Clinton wrong and think about what's going on. Think very carefully about what's going on. Don't worry if you've got a reason to vote for Donald Trump or not. If you want clarity for the November election, think about all of the reasons that we have to vote against Hillary Clinton. And they are legion. Story out of 100% fed up. Apparently, the leaks about Hillary Clinton's health condition aren't being hacked by Russia and Putin. They're literally coming out from former Secret Service agents who worked with the Clintons when they were in the White House and on Hillary's personal detail as a candidate. And one of these agents, uh, Kessler, has come on out and said, Hillary is suffering from Parkinson's disease. She has trouble walking, which we have certainly seen, and apparently flashing lights can cause seizures. And a lot of the corporate media who have been following her around have commented on the fact that they are given instructions never to use a camera flash. I don't use a camera flash anyway. I hate, the, I hate what the lighting does to people. But they're literally being told, don't use a camera flash. So another story coming out of Sputnik News. The Clinton Foundation scandal over the foreign donors blows up on national television. And they're talking about this interview by CNN reporter Dana Bash. The Clinton campaign manager, Robbie Mook, failed to come up with an explanation why the Clinton Foundation would cease accepting donations from foreign investors only in the case if Hillary Clinton becomes president. Well, I think the explanation is obvious here. They, they, they can't just shut down the Clinton Foundation. How will they buy Chelsea the White House without it in 16 years? The damage is already done. This is like closing the barn door after the horse is gone. The the bribes have been paid. The debts are owed. If Hillary Clinton succeeds in stealing the White House, she owes all those donors to the Clinton Foundation big time. And if I am correct, and she was selling secrets to foreign governments in exchange for donations to that foundation, every one of those foreign governments has Hillary by the short and curlies. She's wide open to blackmail, and she will do as she is told. And she'll do it cheerfully. She won't care if it harms ordinary Americans. After all, you don't count, especially if you don't vote for her. Now the story coming out of TheBlaze.com. Hillary Clinton asks for money. What she says is a mystery. Talking about how she's been up there fundraising with very, very rich people living up in Martha's Vineyard and all over that whole area. And the money is pouring on in. But nobody will say what she's talking about. It's all private. The public and, uh, and media are kept out. 
Why all the secrecy? Including her speeches to Wall Street. Well, I have a thought. And this is only a theory. But I I want you to think about this for a bit. The entire Bush-Clinton narcocracy traces back to that CIA gun and drug running operation out of Arkansas in the 1980s that eventually became known as the Iran-Contra scandal. Now, everyone who took part in the CIA's smuggling operation or helped launder the money or manufacture the weapons became very rich in the process. And it established a new ruling elite of drug lords. CIA-connected drug lords, but drug lords nonetheless. Now, no administration since Iran-Contra has made any significant reduction in the flow of illegal drugs into the United States of America. They'll grab a street user and slap them around for the sake of the media, but that's about it. But Donald Trump is not part of that narcocracy. And his winning the White House might signal a real war on drugs, one that targets the smugglers, the dealers, and the money launderers, rather than those token arrests of users. And from that, I would theorize that a large part of Hillary's wealthy constituency is made up of those people who became wealthy in connection with the CIA's gun and drug running operations, which persist to this very day. Just something for you to think about. There's a new image for Hillary's supporters. Drug lords. Now, Paul Joseph Watson has uh, wagged a finger a little bit at Hillary Clinton, who's out there on the campaign trail talking about how she's so concerned about the environment. And yet she took a private jet to travel just 20 miles from Martha's Vineyard to Nantucket. Apparently, Hillary is above taking the ferry like ordinary people would do. And it shows one more time that what Hillary says and what she does are completely unconnected. Now, Sputnik News is reporting on the latest media polls are showing Donald Trump surging ahead of Hillary Clinton. The corporate media is still reporting on polls from three weeks ago to insist Hillary Clinton is still ahead. And a reminder, all of the online polls not connected with corporate media have Donald Trump way out in front. And surprise, 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 support for Donald Trump is surging among the black and Latino voters that Hillary was counting on to put her over the top. Now, from the black voters' perspective, Black Lives Matter leadership absolutely laid it out. The Dem- Hillary can't be trusted to keep any of her promises. That trust issue is really coming back. The Latino voters are realizing that this flood of illegal immigrants is harming the social standing of those who came to this country by the legal immigration methods. They want it to stop. And that's why they're supporting Donald Trump. Hillary has completely misread the Latino voters in this regard. She just thought that Latino voters would welcome more Latinos coming across the border and not care how they got there. And she missed that one, apparently. Now, the Republican National Committee has basically chastised BuzzFeed Univision for a report that Donald Trump had succumbed to amnesty activists and was going to grant legal status to illegal aliens in the United States. Obviously, a piece of propaganda put out to undermine Donald Trump's support among those who favor strong, controlled borders. And we're going to see a lot more of that. We're going to see a lot more of that in the controlled media. And yes, a lot of the independent media on the Internet have now fallen under control. You're probably seeing all these stories where these very rich corporations and individuals are trying to buy up some of the more well-known media outlets on the Internet in order to co-opt them and turn them into more propaganda machines. we got to take a break for commercials. We'll be right back. What this country is coming to, I sure would like to know. If they don't do something by and by, the rich will live and the poor will die. Doggone, I mean the panic is on. Can't get no way, can't draw no pay. 
And Aloha America, welcome back to the show here. And a reminder, our 800 number is not working again today. If you want to call into the show, the number is area code 512-716-1523. So, now then. Speaking of the polls, apparently Donald Trump is surging way ahead in Pennsylvania, one of the battleground states, to the point where the Clinton campaign is starting to pull their ads. They, they can't get traction up there. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is out there saying, whites becoming a minority in America is the source of our strength. You know something? You don't end racism by being racist. And that's exactly what this whole thing is. Black Lives Matter. It's racism in reverse. They don't want equality. They want to reverse the prior social order. And if you look at how well that worked out in Zimbabwe, you will understand why I don't think it's really a good idea. Now... I was on the Richie Allen show just before I came on the air here. And one of the things we talked about is how the current political propaganda campaign uh, is really destroying the credibility of the corporate media all over the country. And we're seeing articles like this one that came out of uh, highpost.com. American journalism is collapsing before our eyes because they're going to such lengths to attack Donald Trump and protect Hillary Clinton, everybody sees what's going on. All of the major TV networks, all of the major corporate newspapers, they've abandoned all pretense of fair play and objectivity. And very clearly, their agenda that has been handed down from on high is you will, you will block Donald Trump we need to preserve the narcocracy and make the American people think it's a good idea. Another article coming out of Investment Watch blog, the mainstream media is basically committing suicide for Hillary. And we are seeing at all of the Donald Trump uh, rallies where Trump supporters will basically be outside the little media pen where they're kept chanting do your job do your job or tell the truth and tell your truth and the corporate media reporters are just freaking out they're hurting our feelings they're making us feel bad i need a safe zone all right well go on back to your corporate media hangouts but the trump supporters are right the corporate media has absolutely failed in its traditional role as watchdog on government abuse they're the Ministry of Propaganda, and everybody sees it right now. Latest polls, only 6% of the American public think the corporate media is trustworthy at all. And that's why they're on the warpath against the independent media. How dare those people use the truth and spoil our million-dollar paychecks? I mean, really, they're, they're not playing fair. They're using the truth. <clears throat> Another article on the same vein from the Daily Caller. If you only read the New York Times and the Washington Post, you would have absolutely no idea that George Soros Foundation suffered a major data leak exposing how Soros, because of his mass wealth, thinks he has a right to treat planet Earth and all of the human race like his own personal toys. To just play with them. Let's see what's going to happen here. Let's have some fun. Oh, a couple of million people died. Well, more of those. The corporate media is out there protecting him, just like they're protecting Hillary Clinton and the New World Order. Now, down in Virginia, there's been a big fight over the issue about whether felons should be allowed to vote. The, the law has been for a very long time that if you are convicted of a felony, you lose your right to vote. But down in Virginia, which is one of the places where Hillary and Trump are neck and neck, our Virginia's governor, and he's a longtime Clinton confidant, Terry McAuliffe. And that's a name that goes back to the early Clinton days as well. Is trying to restore voting rights to 200,000 ex-felons on the assumption that they will vote for their fellow felon-in-waiting, Hillary Clinton. And the court struck it down that he just couldn't do a blanket uh, reassignment of voting rights to these ex-felons. And so he's literally hired the staff to go through and process the paperwork on a case-by-case -case basis. And it says he will have those 200,000 ex-felons eligible to vote by the November election. I'm going to take another break here. We'll be right back. 
Now, interesting little video that we have on the front page of WhatReallyHappened.com where a citizen investigator literally caught Clinton workers committing voter fraud in Las Vegas. And what they found were these people pretending, well, they were registering voters, registering mostly Democratic voters. They, they were saying, we registered one Republican, honest, we did. And on the back of the clipboard, they had Stop Donald Trump. They had all these pro-Hillary leaflets to hand out. Now, voting registrars are not supposed to do that. That's against the law in Nevada. They're supposed to be nonpartisan, register everybody. And this lady was handing out pro-Hillary leaflets and had stopped Trump. And the guy pressed her on it, and she admitted she worked for the Democratic Party. And even more interestingly, she doesn't even live in Nevada. When she, when she got into her truck to make good her escape, the license plate said California. And now that people are alert to this, they're starting to see this same thing going on in other states. Hillary Clinton plans to steal the November election. All right, let's go ahead and grab a phone call. Ken in California, Aloha, welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Aloha. Um, basically, uh, you were just speaking earlier before your commercial break uh, about uh, the felons. And I've always been brought up being told that uh, if, you're, if, you do a, if you commit a crime and you do your time, you should be restored. Isn't that the way it was supposed to be, or am I in error? Well, the, the, the current law is, uh, depending upon the felony you committed, uh, you have to live a good, crime-free life for so many years after you're released from prison. What uh, Terry McAuliffe is doing over there in Virginia uh, is he's trying to bypass that law to allow these 200,000 uh, felons to vote in the November election. Right, but you do, have a, you do have a chance, if you do have a felony, to be restored other other ways by by like you said living a good clean life staying out of trouble and all that right that's what i was brought up believing i don't have a felony thing well it, but, it changes uh, I, I, it changes from state to state but in virginia the reason this is uh such a this ran into trouble at the court is because under virginia law the felon has to file a formal application for restoration of his voting right or her voting rights uh and be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and what Terry oh. McAuliffe and his people are doing is they're filling out the paperwork for the felons to get them re-registered. Oh, okay. Yeah, I misunderstood then because, um, you know, I, I, I figure that, you know, you know, if you screw up, you should have a chance to redeem yourself. So that's, that's why I called. I wasn't sure. I, I was pretty sure that you can have your rights restored after you've lost them as long as, like you said, you, you lead a good, productive uh, life and society so yeah if the, if the governor's doing that that that's a little uh, absurd yeah it, it really is and uh, again it's no secret he's a clinton supporter they're not even trying to hide the fact that they're going to steal this election in fact their attitude seems to be what the heck are you going to do about it we're going to put on this theater pageant and declare empress hillary the first and there's not a thing you american people can do about it that seems to be their Better. attitude Matter of fact, Michael, before I before your show even came out today, I watched a video on YouTube. It was comparing the crowds between Hillary Clinton's uh, whatever you call her events Rallies. and uh, the Donald. Yeah, well, uh, I, I know the right term, but I was trying to think of a something snarky. Um, okay. But um, basically. Uh, uh, the, the crowds that are showing up to the Trump rallies, Hillary hasn't even got an equivalency anywhere near that uh, i mean yeah, she's, she's running about 10 she's running about 10 percent here well you know the reason for that is very very simple dead people can vote but they can't show up at her rallies yeah it's kind of hard yes <laughs> all right thank you michael i'll uh, go back to listening and let you get back to work thank you all right thank you very much for the phone call we're going to let you go now Barack Obama is responding to all of the allegations and lawsuits and confirmation of massive election fraud during the primaries by saying he is going to make everything all better by taking over control of the elections and handing it to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if he really thinks that anybody is going to believe this guarantees an honest election, uh, then he's dreaming. Uh, this is actually making it worse. Because what is needed here is civilian oversight, not another layer of the same corrupt government uh, nodding its head and saying, oh, yes, the elections were fair, the elections were honest, and you can't prove otherwise, therefore you have to do what we tell you. And they're trying to basically close it off. The goal here 
is to limit the ability of citizens to actually inspect what's going on with the elections. Remember that guy in New York who came on out and showed in all the precincts that Hillary had won in New York in the primary? Uh, her official results were more than 20% above what the exit polls indicated. 2% represents election fraud, both under U.S. State Department rules and the United Nations. But they don't want you to be able to get those numbers anymore. They don't, they don't want Bev Harris to be able to look inside those election machines anymore. They literally want to turn our election system into a giant black box where you obediently walk into the polling place, you press a little red button, and then they tell you who your rulers are the next day. That's what's going on here. Now, Election Justice USA, which is a nonpartisan group, has done a study, and they have concluded that Bernie Sanders lost 184 delegates to election fraud during the primaries. And they documented instances of targeted voter suppression, registration tampering. Remember all those people who went in and all of a sudden their registrations had changed from Democrat to uh, independent or Republican or something? Illegal voter purges, voting machine tampering, they found evidence for that. And the leaked DNC emails confirmed the Democratic Party leadership were fully on board, stealing the primary for Hillary Clinton, and it should have gone to Bernie Sanders. In an honest election, he would have won by a landslide. 184 delegates would have even overcome Hillary's bought and paid for superdelegates. Hillary stole that nomination. She shouldn't even be on the ballot in November, is what it comes down to. Now then, <clears throat> this is a warning shot. Hillary Clinton is literally out there saying that as president, she will shut down the independent media. That means us. Now, her comments were specifically targeting Breitbart News. And she was hemming and hawing and say, saying she doesn't have an objection to an opposition corporate media under corporate control, but all these little independent media people all over the Internet accusing her of all the things she's actually done is really just too much for her to bear. She wants to put away the scandals of the past and launch her presidency focused totally on the new scandals she's going to be committing. And so she has declared war on the independent media that pesky little thing about the First Amendment notwithstanding. Now, we already know what Hillary's people are going to say. The Founding Fathers didn't know about the Internet, and therefore the First Amendment can't be construed as protecting speech on the Internet. Well, that's an uphill battle. And if Hillary gets to pick Supreme Court judges, she may actually pull it off. But when the Founding Fathers wrote that First Amendment, the only media that was out there was a printing press. And each time a new technology has come along, telegraph, radio, television the supreme court has said the first amendment right to freedom of speech carries forward onto these new forms of media and the same principle would apply here but hillary is declaring war on the independent media the gloves are off apparently now there's another story coming on out of conservative daily post they're going through all the documents that were leaked by the original romanian hacker guccifer and they have discovered information confirming that Hillary Clinton, while Secretary of State, approved a massive weapons shipment from a California company to Libyans opposed to Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 in violation of a United Nations arms ban, then in effect. And many of those same weapons were later smuggled to ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria. So we have Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State defying the United Nations. Now, defying the United Nations was given as one of the reasons for the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And here we have Hillary doing exactly the same thing. And by the way, it did turn out that with regard to Saddam Hussein, he wasn't in violation of UN directives and resolutions. He had gotten rid of all of his chemical and biological weapons, and he never had nuclear weapons. How many more times do you have to be lied to by this government and this corporate media before you're willing to have the courage to stand up and say, I'm not going to be lied to any longer? Now, the media is still out there trying to link Donald Trump to Putin. 
They're going back to the 1950s and 1960s when Americans were brainwashed by their public education to wet themselves on hearing the word commie or Russia or any of that other stuff. And, of course, they're focused on this one link with uh, uh, Donald Trump's, uh, one of his campaign staffers, that goes back to when Russia and the U.S. were still friends. And meanwhile, they're still ignoring totally that Uranium One deal in which Secretary of State Hillary Clinton turned over 20% of the United States uranium ore assets to this joint Canada-Russian company after getting generous donations from that company into her foundation. Now, it's no secret here that the military-industrial complex yearns to return to the days of the Cold War when vast sums of money flowed from the pockets of you, the ordinary people, into the defense contractors who produced expensive weapons of dubious usefulness. And they got away with it because, in theory, those weapons would never actually be used. As long as they could fake some kind of a demo that says this works, that was it. Now, politicians long for the days when the American people were brainwashed to wet their pants at the mention of the word communist and were terrorized into unquestioning obedience, but those days are gone. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of the Russian republics, we were all friends. We all remember not too long ago, Russia and the United States were friends. Trump wants to go back to being friends. What triggered the change was Putin's decision to take direct control of Russia's central bank and run the Russian economy for the benefit of the Russian people, and overnight that made him the enemy of every private central bank around the world and catapulted him to the top spot on the U.S. government's special high-interest targets list. And so now anything bad that happens, it's all the fault of Russia. Oh, the DNC emails, uh, that had to be Russia, even though Assange implied it was a leak from Seth Rich. And let's see, Joe Biden's son is now on the board of a big company in the the Ukraine. It's just all a huge mess. And they're trying to blame it all on, on Putin and to link Trump to him. Now, we have a video on the front of whatreallyhappened.com. And it's where State Department spokesman uh, Jake uh, Tapper lays out this evolving story over this deletion of a video by the State Department in which there was a deletion. Originally, the State Department said it was just a glitch. Then they came on out and said, no, it wasn't a glitch. We were ordered to delete this video, which is a public record, by the way. There's no classified information in it. It's a public policy statement by the State Department. And they Orwellized it. They got Winston Smith in there with a little editing block, and they cut it out. And then the State Department spokesman came on out and said, of course we're going to lie to you. They came on out and admitted the State Department is lying to the public and the media for the sake of what they call diplomacy. Actually, for the sake of protecting their own sorry rear ends. And now they're trying to delete that and say it never happened. Now let's turn to the war zones because things are getting very, very intense out there. The U.S. military commander overseeing Syria has sent a warning to Russia and the Syrian government, we will defend ourselves. Which, if you think about it carefully, you'll realize this is about as silly as Hitler invading France and then saying he'll defend himself from the French forces. Because that's what's going on. The U.S. has now arbitrarily declared a swath of land where their special forces are operating, and said Russia and Syria cannot operate in that area. I think this is the reason they tried that that lame photo of the kid with the, the phony wound on his forehead. Desperate attempt to get Americans to say, yes, we have a right to be in there to stop all this horror on the children. Well, all the horror on the children is because the U.S. has been trying to regime change Syria for five years now. And even if you believe that one kid and that one photo... You have to take into account the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people killed and crippled in this U.S.-initiated war. 
But now the U.S. government has literally gone ahead and declared that part of Syria is now under U.S. control. That's called an invasion. That's called an act of war. And literally telling the Syrian government, you may not run your Syria military over this part of Syria. Now, over in Crimea, the Russians are apparently shooting down U.S. drones that are flying into their airspace to spy. Apparently, it turns out they're very easy to shoot down. And so here you you have the U.S. government again going where it has no business to go. Latest wrinkle in this situation, Yemen is now offering Russia the use of its airports and bases in the war against ISIS and al-Qaeda, meaning the U.S.-backed terrorists in Syria. That's going to complicate things because that government that's currently in charge of Yemen is the U.S.-installed puppet regime, and they just turned around and told Washington, D.C., we think it's time to switch to the other side. Russia, Iran, and China are basically sending a message. It's time to slap the New World Order agents across the face. Actually, I'd rather go for a punch into the gonads at this point. They're getting numb to slaps across the face. They're not getting the message. Iran has released photographs of its first internally manufactured missile defense system. Uh, They're keeping close watch about it. They're calling it the Bavar 373 Air Defense Complex, designed to track down and penetrate targets like drones and missiles and combat aircraft at various altitudes. Iran says that they will have their own domestically produced supersonic cruise missile in the very near future. And that's something the U.S. does not have an adequate defense against. Got to take a break for commercials, and we'll be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to our show. We're going to go ahead and grab a phone call. Glenn in Philadelphia, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello, Mike. I hope you won't terribly mind a sort of a serendipitous uh, digression here to a topic that's a little more akin to what Jeff or George might have on. Um, just very briefly. And the reason I'm calling is because is I think it's something that it's, the more eyes are on this, that everybody watching to see what transpires, um, the more, you know, the more honest people can be kept in this. Uh, you, as you know, the International Space Station is a collaborative effort at this point, um, you know, being tended by both Russian ships and American ships. The Russian uh, tenders, ships, they go up there that, uh, you know, take supplies and scientific mm-hmm. stuff up and bring back, uh, bring back completed scientific stuff and, and, um, trash. They throw all their trash in and, and their stuff like that. The Russian ships are government and the, the U.S. ships are um, the U.S. ship right now that there, there is a privatized one from SpaceX called the Dragon. Yes. And they're, they're, Okay, so this ties in secondarily from a, a fellow who's hypothesized about this, and it ties into a project being conducted by a remote viewing group. You might be familiar with the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats with George Clooney. Okay, uh, yeah, it, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to let you go here. I kind of had a feeling the way you were hemming and hawing about this that you were going <clears> to <throat> go into that whole thing about, well, you were going to just do something to try and make us look like we're a bunch of goofballs over here. All righty, and uh, let's see. Now then, getting on back to the real world here, the new oil minister of Iraq is signaling rapprochement with the Kurdish region. Now, remember, the U.S. agenda and the Israeli agenda is to balkanize all the large nations in the Middle East into smaller and smaller pieces that are easier to bully and push around. And they've been pushing this idea of an independent Kurdistan to be carved out of parts of Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. And obviously, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria are not happy about that. Uh, The U.S. has definitely been in there supporting the Kurdish rebels. Uh, to cause as much trouble as they can. And then all of a sudden, the Iraq oil minister, who's a representative of the puppet government the U.S. put into Iraq, is saying, you know, let's just work together and share those oil revenues. Wow, what a great idea. Peace through commerce. So the U.S. agenda in the Middle East is in serious, serious, serious trouble. And Israel is behaving... Well, like Israel, apparently Hamas staged a parade uh, in the Gaza Strip, at which point Israel attacked. How dare you have a parade? Apparently a single stray mortar shell crossed into Israeli territory from Syria 
didn't hit anything at all, Israel launched an artillery attack into Syria. They're just looking for any excuse they can to start killing people with those weapons that your tax dollars paid for. And here is another little indicator that the agenda is falling apart. We're going to take a break for station identification. We'll be right back. Hour number two, the phone lines are open, but again, the 800 number is not working. So if you want to call into the show and talk to me, the number is area code 512-716-1523. Now, I want to step back from the war zone back to the political campaign because this story just came across my desk and I do need to share it with you. A tech writer for the New York Times has written an article saying that Google ought to hide all online information about Hillary's health problems in response to New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani's comment that all you have to do is go online and locate the truth about what Hillary is dealing with. So here you have the New York Times instructing Google to basically exercise censorship and a denial of the free speech rights of the American people, not to mention the American people have a right to know if a potential candidate for president has mental issues that would uh, impair her judgment. And that's a very real concern. If Hillary was dealing with uh, a bad back like Kennedy or even polio like Roosevelt, this would be a non-issue because those do not affect the ability of the person to make decisions, and that's what the job of the president is. But when we're talking about blood clots in the brain, possible Parkinson's, and all of these Secret Service descriptions of what an incredible temper Hillary has, and then look at all Hillary's defenders, the excuses they're coming up with. Oh, she didn't remember clearly. She gets confused. She had a brain short circuit. This is a very, very serious issue when we're talking about somebody who's going to have the keys to the nuclear weapons. Now, getting on back to the war zones and the deteriorating uh, U.S. agenda for the Middle East, Egyptian President al-Sisi is now saying that he is ready to host a meeting between Netanyahu and Palestinian Chairman Mohammed Abbas to try and settle down the differences in the region. I'm sure Abbas will agree, Netanyahu maybe not. But remember, al-Sisi is also a U.S.-installed puppet who was put in there after Morsi was brought down, after kicking out the previous U.S. puppet, Mubarak. Even more interesting, Palestine is going to get a visit from Russia's Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, is going to pay an official visit to Palestine on November 11th to discuss bilateral cooperation and regional issues. And Israel and the U.S. have given the Palestinians every reason to pivot to Russia. They have misplayed this from the beginning. One mistake after the other after the other. All righty, we're going to go ahead and grab a phone call. Joe in Pennsylvania, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Michael. I just wanted to, uh, another guy who's uh, real, real, or I'm sorry, real, and uh, dear to my heart, like you are, is a guy by the name of uh, David M. Robertson. And uh, okay. he's an author. And he writes a, a book called uh, Reloaded, an American Warning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I actually I actually want to send you a copy of it. Is there a way I can send you a copy? Uh, yeah. Actually, if you go to my page, up on the top, you'll see a, a, a little item on the right side that says donate and there's a postal address in there that you can use to send me uh, uh, books and stuff okay okay thank you sir all right and i'll definitely take a look at uh, the book Uh, i get a lot of books sent to me Uh, cambridge press is sending me a bunch of books Uh, they just sent me this one called unraveled obamacare religious liberty and executive power and we're trying to get the author on as a guest uh somewhere down the road So uh, thank you, Joe. We're going to let you go here. Getting on back to the news, uh, if you have been around the intelligence community or the military-industrial complex for a long time, you know about the RAND Corporation. This is the top think tank used by the government. And apparently their current advice to the U.S. government is you're better off starting a war with China now than waiting and giving China uh, any more opportunity to upgrade their weapons. 
So they're literally out there talking about a war with China, for those of us living out here in the Pacific, <clears throat> with a first strike nuclear target right out that their window. This is very upsetting. But my word to the people of Rand Corporation is if you think war with China is a really good idea, here's your rifle, here's your parachute, here's your day glow orange jumpsuit, have fun, and don't forget to send some egg rolls back. Now, another story coming out of Russia today talking about the Russian threat, the Russian threat, the Russian threat. And they're basically echoing the advice that we got from the Watergate scandal. Follow the money. Who is paying for all this constant Russian threat nonsense? Russia is stealing socks from your dryer. Russia is hiding your car keys. Russia put waxy yellow buildup in your kitchen floor corners. And it's very, very tiresome. And most of this money that is funding this is coming from the defense contractors who are looking at a new war as good for their business. And they're not thinking very carefully. They're not looking at the history of the collapse of the former Soviet Union. I mean, first of all, the fact that a lot of people are going to get killed in these sales support wars, they, they see that as just the cost of doing business. Your sons and your daughters getting blown to bloody bits, well, that's just how we make our money. And you should just get used to that. But here's our problem. Back at the height of the last Cold War, the United States had a very strong economy, very strong manufacturing, good agriculture, good export markets. We had money coming in. And the parasite called the Pentagon could siphon off a big chunk of that. And it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't critical. It's different today. Our economy is stressed to the breaking point. We can't support any additional military spending. And this new Cold War they're trying to sell, followed by massive defense contracts, could literally implode the entire U.S. economy. Russia isn't the existential threat to the nation. The military-industrial complex is. And the Soviet military was guilty of the same short-sightedness. Even as the Soviet Union was struggling with a, with a hard economy, they kept saying, more weapons, more weapons, more weapons, and they literally bankrupted the place. Now, remember what I said earlier, that the scam of the Cold War is they build very expensive weapons that don't work really well, and they get away with it because they're not supposed to be used. And we have been talking about how America's latest generation of weapons is very expensive and doesn't work really well. F-22 still asphyxiating its pilots. F-35, the problems are just legion on that one. Independence class littoral combat ships, corrosion on the hull. Freedom class littoral combat ships, powertrain issues. The Gerald R. Ford, the magnetic catapults won't work. The radars won't work. That's just all over the place. And now we're seeing this article. Uh, actually, it's a YouTube video talking about the M1 Abrams tank. Now, this is an icon of tankness around the world, and uh, it, it looks cool <clears throat> if you're into that sort of thing. It is the world's most expensive and cumbersome tank, and it does very, very well against third world armies with 1950s technology, but put up head-to-head -head with the latest main battle tanks coming out of Russia and China. It's coming up short. That latest one from Russia, the Armada, is an amazingly capable weapon. As I said, the strategic failing of the United States military is they're refining the weapons that they used to win the last war, and they missed the boat on the changing paradigm for the next one. So let's talk about the economy right now. Rothschild, Jacob Rothschild, is out there basically saying that, yes, this whole global private central banking system is on the verge of collapse. He knows about that 11th marble. He's getting out of the stock market and paper currencies. He is buying gold. And he is not the only one. There have been a wave of billionaires getting out of the stock market, buying gold. They're all trying to grab as much gold as they can. And if they can't get enough, they'll have government take yours away and give it to them, just like Roosevelt did back in 1933. 
The Federal Reserve has finally admitted that another $4 trillion, that's with a T, in quantitative easing will be needed to offset an economic shock. In other words, if they don't get another $4 trillion in instantly created money, all of it considered a loan to you, the American people, at interest, they're not going to be able to keep the stock market propped up any longer. And certainly their goal is to keep it propped up and looking good until after the November election. Over in Germany, the German people are furious that their private central bank, the Bundesbank, is saying it's time to raise the retirement age until 69. The new policy for the new world order is work them until they drop. Retirement. Why should we let them retire? They're not useful to the new world order. Let's just kill them off and decrease the surplus population. Down in Chile, they're having nationwide protests regarding pension reform down there. And they've got a private pension system was launched all the way back in the 1980s during the Pinochet dictatorship, and it's in serious trouble, just like Social Security is here in the United States. It was plundered, it was looted by corrupt politicians. They're very unhappy about that. John Deere, and if you're a farm kid, you know that name. They're laying off 145 workers at their eastern Iowa plants. Apparently, people aren't buying tractors and harvesters and combines uh, as rapidly as they were. They're basically saying there's downturns in the agriculture sector. Well, I can tell you why that's happening. Nobody wants to buy our GMO agriculture anywhere on Earth. And everybody who got sucked into planting those GMO seeds, they're not finding places to sell them. Certainly not outside the United States. So if nobody else in the world wants to eat America's GMO food because it's dangerous, what is the U.S. government going to do? They're going to feed it to you. They're going to make it illegal for you to know that you're eating potentially unhealthy food. And if you get sick, well, that's good for the economy because then you've got to go to the doctor and you have to buy medicine. And it's all wonderful here. You know, we'll, we'll grind you up into a paste if it makes the economy look better. Apparently, iron ore shipment on the Great Lakes is down 18% over the five-year average. That's significant. People aren't ordering raw iron. Steel makers aren't making steel. Car makers aren't making cars out of that steel. It's all locking up. Because all the nation's wealth is in the pockets of those money junkie bankers. And they're hanging on to it. They're opposed to the idea of actually letting it back out to the economy to do some good. In the wake of the Brexit, the uh, European Union leaders are meeting on exactly the same Italian island where they actually created that federal Europe idea. They're trying to figure out how they're going to stop the Brussels project unraveling following the Brexit because there are so many other countries in the EU are, are saying we want out. Italy's talking about getting out. Netherlands is talking about getting out. They've had it. It's a failed idea. It was supposed to just be a free trade block with open borders, and it turned into one of history's greatest dictatorships. And it failed because there was a built-in self-destruct device called the European Central Bank, which looted the people of Europe the way the Federal Reserve is looting the American people, and that plan to flood Europe with refugees to destroy the idea of a European identity has not gone as smoothly as they thought it would. Obama is going to allow another 200,000 refugees in September of this year. According to Pew Research, 50% of all refugees ending, uh, entering America this year are Muslim. Don't have a number on how many of them are actually terrorists. And across Europe, we're still seeing these problems, this societal friction, this culture shock. Apparently over in Belgium, there was a woman with a machete attacked three people. Nobody died. The injuries are minor. And I'm sure over here in the U.S., all the gun grabbers are saying, a machete? I can't use a machete. Why can't these crazies use an AR-15 so we can ban guns in the U.S.? Get that fast and furious team to smuggle some assault weapons over there to Europe and give them to the refugees. We need blood and bullets to take guns away from the law-abiding American citizen. Meanwhile, European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker 
in anti-nationhood speech at Albach European Forum in Austria, said borders are the worst invention ever. That's his attitude. There should be no borders. Of course, Juncker himself lives inside a fenced and gated residential complex. Now, my view of borders around nations is that they serve the same function that fireproof doors do in a building and watertight bulkheads do in a ship. They contain disaster. They confine the fire to one office. They confine the flooding to one compartment. And the structure as a whole survives. If you prop open those fire doors, if you lock open those watertight hatches, it may seem things are better because you can move around more quickly, but the first fire or the first leak destroys the whole system. But Juncker is one of those people who wants a single golden throne for planet Earth, and he wants to sit on it. And he doesn't care who suffers along the way. You know, you know, growing up, we all saw the stories about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, look what he did. He conquered all of the known world, Alexander the Great. And you don't think about what it cost the ordinary people who were in his way. And that's what these imperial thinkers are like. They want their single global government, their single global private central bank, and they don't care if your lives are destroyed by it. They serve a higher, more noble purpose, which is their own vanity and wealth, of course. So let's talk about that Louisiana flooding situation. Donald Trump did absolutely the right thing going on down there. He did bring help. He brought that 18-wheeler. Funny, I haven't heard that that Clinton Foundation, with all of its billions of dollars, has sent anything down to Louisiana. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? The black flood victims in Louisiana are calling out Black Lives Matter and the Black Panthers group because they didn't show up to help. The floods are being ignored because they they can't claim it's racism. The flood only wrecked the black people's houses. No, it wrecked everybody. 60,000 homes lost. But if they can't use it for the political agenda, they don't care. Now, there's one heartwarming story that's coming out of the floods. And we do feel sorry for everybody who got hit. Remember Tony Perkins? He's president of the Family Research Council. And this guy is out there. He, he's, he's basically saying God sends natural disasters to punish the gays. And his house was destroyed by the flood. <laughs> Good one, God. Got the right guy finally. Down in Texas... There's a federal judge has temporarily blocked President Obama's requirement that boys be allowed to use the girls' restrooms in public schools across the country. Basically saying that Obama's unilateral declaration of this is actually unconstitutional. It exceeds his authority as President of the United States of America. Yes, it does. And what is really amazing when you think about it, we have an economy that's on the verge of collapse. We're at war with who knows how many people. We're on the edge of an outright world war that could go nuclear. Our infrastructure is collapsing. And the Democrats' biggest achievement is letting boys use the girls' restrooms. That's Obama's legacy. You know, forget Obamacare. Forget about NSA spying. Forget about all of this stuff there. President Obama allowed boys to use the girls' restroom. That's going to look really good in the history books there, people. It really is very, very silly. All right, so let's talk about computers a little bit. And I I want to preface this by saying, when I was younger and just starting into computers, and they were simple and easy to understand, I really did enjoy them. You had machines like the Apple II or the Commodore 64 where you could understand everything that was going on inside it. But They're not the big, bloated, corporatized, you know, where you're not allowed to look inside anymore systems that we have today. Uh, and I don't have the love affair with computers that I used to, especially because of all the time that I spend patching and updating and securitizing uh, instead of actually doing useful work that I could get paid for. And that's something that's affecting our economy as a whole. More about this after we come back from these words from our sponsors. And Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show. And we're talking about computers and how... 
uh, due to the corporatizing influence, computers have grown from simple, useful devices to very bloated, complicated systems that the average end user really doesn't understand, which I'm sure is a blessing to that permanent part of the economy that comes in and fixes things. Uh, and it really is, it's out of our control. Even Microsoft cannot maintain its own operating systems anymore. We've allowed our technology to escape from us. And in a lot of ways, it mimics ancient Rome. Rome, at the height of its power, came up with a lot of wonderful stuff, like concrete, the roads. But all of it had to be maintained. And as Rome's economic fortunes went into decline, they had to let all of it just sort of rot away and turn into tourist attractions. And the same thing is starting to happen here in the U.S. Because so much wealth is being drawn out of our society for war, the money junkies, Israel. Everybody's cutting corners. We've already entered a, a, a stage where computer software companies treat the end user like they're unpaid quality control inspectors. They'll release products with known problems and wait for the consumers to complain and send in a bug report, and then maybe they'll get around to fixing it. And, of course, when we're sitting here trying to figure out what's not working in our latest and greatest version of Windows, we're not doing things that might actually generate revenue for our business. Microsoft fortunes are literally built on stealing productivity from their own end users. Their latest goof up there is the Windows 10 anniversary update has killed webcams, a lot of them. And Microsoft has apologized. We feel really bad about this. But they're not going to be able to fix it until sometime in September, if then. And another embarrassment for uh, Microsoft uh, was over in Thailand. As you know, more and more buildings uh, have these electronic billboards on them. Especially if you go to Times Square, you see them all over the place. And they're run by computer systems, and many of them are Windows machines. And somebody got a picture of this five-story tall digital display on the side of a building showing the Microsoft blue screen of death. So I think that may hold the Guinness World Book record for the biggest b uh in all of history. And, of course, it's another embarrassment for Microsoft. Now, talking about the snooping that's been going on, and there's a lot of it, and we probably don't know the extent of it. We only found out last week that the NSA has been able to bypass security on Cisco routers for years to get into your machines. And there's an article that came out from ArsTechnica.com called How the NSA Snooped on Encrypted Internet Traffic for a Decade and that talks about this, how the NSA spied on Cisco Systems customers because they had an attack that would extract the decryption key from Cisco's PIX firewalls. Now, Cisco has now discontinued them, but they're still out there being used. And the attack code, dubbed Benign Certain, worked on PIX version Cisco released in 2002 and supported through 2009. But the NSA has been doing this all along. All of this goes back to the Echelon project of the 1980s and even before that. For the government to just spy on ordinary people. And in all this NSA spying, they haven't actually found any real criminals or terrorists. They just spy on the law abiding. We proved with our NSA encryption challenge that real criminals and real terrorists can create systems of encryption the NSA cannot break. That's the reality. The NSA is able to spy on you because you naively buy off-the-shelf products where the NSA knows the methodology or they've installed a backdoor. And that means the NSA is institutionally incapable of finding real criminals and real terrorists. So they justify their budgets watching you. 
We'll be right back. We're talking about NSA snooping, and of course, it's not just the NSA. It's GCHQ, FBI, everybody. Apparently, all over the world, governments have become so afraid of their own population, uh, they feel they have a need, uh, if not the right, to just monitor everything that we do, whether it is constantly tracking our location using our cell phones, listening to us over that speakerphone mic on the cell phone, turning on the cameras remotely. And none of this has anything to do with crime and terror. This is all a violation here in the United States of the Fourth Amendment right to privacy. That government does not have permission to come in and just root around your personal materials unless they know that a crime has been committed. They're not allowed to do fishing expeditions. And the joke in all of this, I mean, they're getting huge amounts of money to do this. Oh, we're going to monitor everything. It'll be great. It'll be just like the movies. We push a button and the terrorist pops out. No, it won't work. Real criminals and real terrorists know the communication infrastructure is completely compromised. They're going to use dead drops. They're going to use who knows what all else. As I mentioned in the last segment, We already proved on this website and on this radio show, it is easy, very easy for real criminals and terrorists to write their own systems of encryption that will defeat the NSA. And the reason for that is very, very simple. When you are trying to decode an encrypted message, it's a two-step process. The first step is finding out the methodology How does it take the clear data and manipulate it based on the key to come up with the encrypted form of the data? After you have the methodology, then you can find the key itself. That's the easy part. If you look at the history of the Enigma machine in World War II, they were unable to break those messages until they physically captured a machine. That gave them the methodology after which uh, Alan Turing was able to create that machine that would brute force the keys and get the encryption keys so they could read the messages. When World War II was over, all the records at Bletchley Park were destroyed, and the U.S. government and Great Britain made presents of captured Enigma machines to friendly governments without mentioning to them that the U.S. and Britain could read the messages encrypted on those machines, just to give you an idea of how they operate. So, if they have the methodology, they can find the keys. If you're using an off-the-shelf encryption system built into Microsoft, built into uh, uh, Macintosh, then they already have the methodology. If you're using something you downloaded from the Internet, they've got the methodology, and they will get the keys. Real criminals, real terrorists are going to be able to evade that simply by coming up with a new methodology. Look how hard security researchers had to work to be able to get inside, uh, for example, Stuxnet or the new one. And that's just the reality. And so GCHQ and NSA and FBI can't go back to the government and say, well, we actually can't get in to the uh, encrypted traffic of real criminals and terrorists because then their budgets get cut. They go back and continue and say, oh, we can monitor everybody. We can monitor everybody. The only people they're monitoring are law-abiding citizens who don't have anything to hide. And their reach is growing. Apparently up in Canada, they're talking about a law that will make it a criminal offense to refuse to turn over your encryption keys if you're using any kind of encryption. And there's a way around that as well. If you've written your own encryption system, have a couple of extra passwords inside there. Where if the wrong password gets typed in, it overwrites the encrypted file. There's all kinds of ways around this. And again, dead drops, uh, uh, solid state memories inside hollowed out nickels. 
they're going about this the entire wrong way. Of course, the way I think that you can end terrorism is to stop messing around with other people's countries and more to the point, stop signing the checks for the terrorists. Because it turns out the terrorists are working for nation states to create terror to scare their populations into obedience. Look at all the documents that have come out from the State Department, from uh, leaked emails. The U.S. government, President Barack Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton were smuggling weapons to the terrorists, ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria. And it kind of reminds me of that old joke about guy sees a stranger looking around on the ground under a street light. Says, what are you doing? Says, I'm looking for my wedding ring. I dropped it. First guy says, where'd you drop it? He says, over on Elm Street. Says, what are you doing here? Says, well, the light's better. That's exactly what it is. Under the justification that they're going after criminals and terrorists, they're looking at you and me, the law-abiding citizen. And we do have a right to privacy. The fact that we desire privacy doesn't mean we're engaged in criminal activity. We're always hearing it from the other side. Well, you know, why should you care if we're spying on you, you know, if, uh, if you're not doing anything wrong? Well, maybe I don't feel like sharing pictures of my lovely wife in states of undress. You ever stop to think about that? Or maybe I'm working on a brand new idea for a product that I'm working to get patented that I can get rich off. Maybe I don't want you just stealing that and giving it to a crony. And by the way, that did happen. At the Asia-Pacific Economic Conference up in Seattle, uh, back in the 1990s, big, huge, stink scandal. U.S. government intelligence agents were caught spying on the computers of conference attendees to steal business information to give to Bill Clinton's cronies. Find out what the bids were going to be so they could bid a little bit lower. That's not what we pay these federal agents to be doing. And yet they did. We have a right to privacy against a government that has confirmed time and again they cannot be trusted with our private information. Now, as you know, recently <clears throat> the NSA itself was the victim of a hack. And specifically the target was the Equation Group, whose public face is that of being a bunch of cyber criminals. But Kaspersky traced them on back and said they actually do work for the NSA. And somebody got into their computers or somebody leaked it. All of their hacking tools, the very best that tax dollars can fund, are now out there in the criminal world. So far from making our information technology infrastructure more secure, the NSA has just blown it wide open to be pillaged and picked at by anybody who's got the bitcoins to buy these tools. And this proves that Apple was right to fight the FBI over the iPhone encryption. Because Apple's position was, we don't want to make this tool for you to break into phones because what happens if it breaks out into the wild? A big part of the iPhone uh, mythos, if you will, is that it is secure. It's certainly far more secure than Android. And the FBI was demanding, you make us a tool that allows us to bypass your own security. And Apple said, no, we're not going to do it. Because if it leaks out, it completely destroys Apple's entire reputation for security. And the fact that the NSA got hacked proves that. Now, Time Magazine has come out with another article basically saying that the sudden emergence of hostile and abusive trolls on the Internet can only be solved with formal policing of the Internet by the government. That's their latest thing. We know the trolls are all working for the establishment. We know that Hillary Clinton has a pack called Correcting the Record. It's run by the guy who destroyed Anita Hill to get Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. And they are very well funded. They load up discussion groups with people who will shout abuse at Trump supporters and anybody critical of Hillary Clinton. 
The trolls are working for the establishment, and now they're using these trolls as justification to say, well, we have to start controlling content on the Internet. It's for your own good. And this isn't the first time they've tried to do that. Uh, Again, back in the 1990s when they were talking about this Telecommunications Act, uh, there was a gentleman, Senator Exxon, who proposed the Exxon Amendment. And his Exxon Amendment was for government control of content on the Internet for the children because the Internet had become a haven for pornography. Well, yes and no. Now, we're talking about before web browsers. We're talking about back when uh, the Usenet was the primary peer-to-peer communication system. And Usenet was basically a news group posting system. And there were all different kinds of news groups you could subscribe to, such as really fine photography, cooking groups, knitting groups, woodworking groups, auto-fixing groups. And there was a, uh, a, a hierarchy called the alt hierarchy for alternative and that was where people who were into things like nude pictures and ha- hamsters and duct tape, they would go hang out. And it was all self-policing. And before Senator Exxon started making his speech about the Exxon Amendment, all of a sudden, pornography was pouring all across Usenet into groups where it really didn't belong. And the people in these groups would say, please, there's a whole alt hierarchy for you to post this stuff. It doesn't belong here. And the posters would all get happy and say, I have a First Amendment right to post pornography into this blueberry muffins baking group. And so everybody got suspicious and started looking at the IPs of these uh, people posting the porn. And they all tracked back to government and military IPs. And sure enough, when Senator Exxon got up in Congress, he had his little binder, his blue book, And it was all the same stuff that we'd seen being poured all across the Internet. And his Exxon Amendment was defeated, and like a light switch was thrown, the porn flood disappeared. It's called the Hegelian dialectic, and it's how the government controls you. They create a problem out of thin air. They promote it as a horrible problem. It's a threat to our children. It's a threat to our way of life. And then they offer to sell you a solution in exchange for more of your money and more control over your life. And now they're doing the same thing again with the trolls. They have an army of trolls out there shouting abuse at the gays, abuse at the blacks, racist this, any, uh, attacking Trump supporters. And so what do they do? Oh, we must control the content of the Internet to deal with this troll flood. It's their troll flood! Now, Google is very firmly on the Hillary team, and they've been caught filtering search response. story came out of government slaves where uh, uh, they're starting to interfere with searches for the Clinton body count. Now, if you go to Google and you type certain things in, they'll autocomplete. And Google has turned autocomplete off for anything related to the Clinton body count. It's just another way of trying to, without being obvious about it, keep people from reading this stuff. Now, it's reached the point of such abuse that the Oracle Corporation is starting their own project, the Google Transparency Project. They've set up headquarters in Washington, D.C. Their mission is to out Google's dicey lobbying practices and expose the crony relationships with President Obama and Hillary Clinton, and basically just expose them as being partisan and manipulative. And I'll give you an example of just how petty Google can be. Back in 2015, my wife and I were walking out to the mailbox. We saw the Google car go by. And sure enough, our picture showed up on Google Street View. Now, it's not like it was a good portrait. It's not like you would know it was us unless you knew who we were and where we lived. But I got an email from somebody saying, you have now vanished from Google Street View. And I went back and I checked, and sure enough, Google had reverted to the 2011 image they had taken along the front of our street. So we've now been consigned to oblivion by Google. And I have to laugh at the sheer childishness and pettiness of this. Because they took our picture in 2015. Oh, we can't show the Riveros. And they went back to the picture they had from 2011. Now, if they'd taken a new picture 2016, yeah, okay. But somebody made the decision to go back and use pictures from four years earlier 
because they didn't want Mike and Claire visible on Google Street View. Oh, we can't have that. Did you ever know anybody who got fame and fortune from being caught on Google Street View? I mean, except for the people who got caught having sex. I mean, it's silly. It, it, it's just six-year-old behavior. It really, really is. <sighs> All righty, let's talk about some medical issues here. Um, it turns out, according to a story, uh, according to a recent study, over 92% of prescription antidepressants do not relieve symptoms of depression. In fact, we already know that in many cases they can exacerbate the problems, leading to suicide and mass violence. We're being sold medications that don't work and actually cause harm. But as long as it makes money, it's going to be a good thing. My wife and I were watching a TV show the other day, and it was just totally saturated with these commercials about how important it was to get the HPV vaccine into young girls and young boys. And they actually came on out and said the HPV vaccine might lead to other cancers in young boys. There is no evidence to support that. HPV vaccine causes cervical cancer. Boys don't have cervixes. But if they can sell them to the boys as well as the girls, then it doubles the money. And that's what it's really all about. And we're getting this flood of dangerous, harmful products thrown at us because they're money makers. And if we don't buy them, we're ordered to buy them. Now, the World Health Organization has actually published a manual on how to respond to vaccine deniers in public. They're giving a bunch of talking points about all the scientists who say vaccines are safe and there's no link with autism and, you know, all these other research that show that they're harmful. Oh, it's all been discredited and denied by the government and on and on and on and on. The World Health Organization, and remember, the World Health Organization was on the verge of declaring glyphosate as a human carcinogen, and they got lobbied and pressured back to where they said, well, it's a probable carcinogen, but they wouldn't take that final step. All of these organizations that you think are there to take care of you are there to take care of the corporations. You probably think the U.S. Department of Agriculture is there to protect the safety of agricultural products. No, when you go back and study how it was founded, it was there to promote the agricultural industry. Not safety, not health. Promote the business interests. We'll be right back. I'm getting a lot of emails uh, about my NSA code challenge. It was a while ago. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and repost that to the top of... Uh, what really happened dot com for those of you who feel like playing around with this sort of thing. And <clears throat> by the way, if you're going to devise an encryption system, uh, obviously just using my code verbatim won't work because the NSA already has that. But the code snippets are there as a tutorial for you to sort of figure things out for yourself. Now we're talking about all these harmful chemicals and glyphosate and pesticides and you know, this chemical-based agriculture is a big money maker. It's not always the best thing. Down in South Africa, farmers have quit using chemical pesticides. And they're going back to nature. They're putting ducks in their farmyards to control pests, including snails. It's a great, great idea. I mean, when... I was a farm kid. We always had ducks and chickens and even geese, and they were taking care of the pests. We didn't need to dose the fields with all these chemicals. Especially when you find out they're not very good for our health. <clears throat> now then, along with Brexit and Nexit and Frexit and Gexit and all these others, we're now hearing word about the Clexit. And the Clexit campaign, basically, as the name implies, is the climate exit. And it started down in Australia, and it's basically countries around the world that are walking away from all of this UN climate nonsense about human-caused global warming. And it is a giant scam, and I'm rather surprised because I thought he had more sense than this. Robert Kennedy Jr. is now out there saying, oh, if you don't believe in global warming, there's something wrong with you. 
But like bad vaccines and bad chemicals, it's it's a big money maker. But the Clexit movement is basically trying to prevent the ratification and costly and dangerous Paris Global Warming Treaty. Because first of all, it is another grab for global control over sovereign nations. Remember that push for a global government rests on a foundation of three pillars. Human-caused global warming, requiring a global environmental authority that we all surrender our freedoms to. A global pandemic, which they tried in 2009, that fell flat on its face, requiring uh, submission to a global health authority. And finally, the global financial crash, which seems well on its way. And we'll be told that a single global private central bank will be the solution to that. No, it won't. Oh, the callers are calling in already. We're going to take a break for station identification and start doing some phone calls. We'll be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to our show, hour number three. We've got callers on the line aplenty. Let's start right there with Patrick in Vermont. Aloha, Patrick. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Thank you. Aloha, Michael. How are you today? Doing great. A uh, couple of things. One, I wanted to just say thank you so much for the service that you provide to all of us out here. I'm a longtime listener, but uh, first-time caller, and I just wanted to say you're doing amazing work, and it's deeply appreciated. Well, thank you for the kind words. My pleasure. wanted to change to a uh, different subject, but one that's positive, and hopefully uh, we'll see a lot more of this type of action as we move forward and towards the presidential election. Really excited about Trey Gowdy and the way that he really cuts to the chase when he interviews uh, Lynch and uh, Comey and things like people like that. And as I listen to more of his uh, interrogations, um, I, I really am hopeful. Uh, I think you had mentioned that uh, uh, Donald Trump was looking at him as possibly at the Attorney General, so I'd be looking forward to hearing if that's actually true or if that's just speculation and a recommendation. And then I also wanted to point towards Judge Napolitano and uh, Judge uh, uh, Janine Piero, uh, both of whom are on Fox News, and it kind of surprised me when I first found them that I was getting that kind of kind of straight-up information from Fox. I actually was very surprised and pleasantly so. So looking just looking forward to your comments on, uh, on those folks. Well, uh, I know that uh, the Trump campaign is seriously looking at Trey Gowdy uh, as Attorney General. Uh, the exact status of uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump has made a final decision, we don't know. Uh, there's going to be the issue, of course, of uh, required congressional confirmations. And uh, I think everybody in Congress who's part of that Bush-Clinton narcocracy, uh, they are not going to want Trey Gowdy uh, as Attorney General. Uh, and we're, we're looking at a huge, huge fight because this isn't just about Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. This is the Bush-Clinton narcocracy, the CIA's drug and gun running all the way back to the 1980s, fighting to hold on to the control of the country they've had for the last two decades. And... Uh, uh, by the very nature of the fact that these are people who are engaged in d drug crime, there is nothing they will not do to hang on to power. So Trump needs to be very careful. Gowdy is probably going to face an uphill battle uh, for confirmation. As far as uh, Judge Napolitano and Judge Janine, uh, the fact that they're coming in out of corporate media, that is going to work against them. Uh, but it depends on what Trump wants to do with them. He may uh, simply appoint them to positions that do not require confirmation. Understood. Alrighty. Well, thank you. I'm very, again, very uh, thankful of everything that you do. Look forward to talking to you again someday. All right. Call in again at some point. Thank you for the call. We're going to switch over to Steve in Massachusetts. Aloha, Steve. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Mike. Um, first, I want to talk to you about China. And um, last year, they said they wanted to devalue their currency, and the U.S. said, don't do it. Um, the next day, they had an attack on a chemical plant. Yes. Now we're seeing Turkey, um, Erdogan um, goes up to uh, Putin is, and apologizes for shooting on the uh, planes. The next day, there's an attack on the, um, the airport. Now we're seeing more attacks on Turkey. I, I just don't think it's a coincidence. I think U.S. has a hand on it, and I think they're bullying. I agree. I agree. It's just too, you, you didn't see any attacks on Turkey. Until they went the other way, and all of a sudden, it's just more than a coincidence. I, I just don't buy it. I really don't. I, I absolutely agree with you. 
Uh, anytime uh, any nation on earth starts to uh, be defiant to the United States, bad things happen to them. Uh, we're told it was a suicide bombing by a little tiny kid. Uh, I'm not buying that one either. For all we know, it was a, a stealth drone strike of some kind. And uh, the official story is, oh, terror attack, terror attack. And I'm sure that Erdogan is getting the message through the back channel. No, it wasn't a terror attack. And if you don't stop talking to Vladimir Putin, we're going to have more of these things. Yeah, it just seems to be more and more of the U.S. policy. Um, bully the countries into their way of uh, making deals or else, uh, you know, it's our way or no way. Well, and, the U.S. Uh, government it's, it's, is at- It's going to drive the countries away eventually. You know, it eventually is. the country. Yeah, it, it already yeah. is. I mean, basically, the U.S. government is acting, you know, like a mafia crime family. You know, you do what we tell you or something bad going to happen to you. You know, you got to do things our way or, or, you know, bad things will happen. And that's exactly the way they're, they're acting, uh, like a bunch of mafia thugs. And when you look at the fact that this Clinton-Bush duopoly was steeped, in the corruption of the CIA's gun and drug running operation to Nicaragua, yeah, of course these are the kind of people they are. Yeah, we're just seeing more and more of it, and I, I just think it's going to come to a point where countries are going to say enough is enough. You know, I think it will. We saw that certainly during Prohibition, where the uh, alcohol corruption got to the point where the American people stood up and said, you stop this all right now, and Congress was forced to act and repeal Prohibition, to end the corruption, but of course by that time uh, those who had bought their way to the upper levels of power with illegal alcohol uh, were still firmly entrenched and the corruption continued. All they did is they looked for another illicit substance on which to uh, build and consolidate their power. Did you see that um, um, there was a headline I saw yesterday on uh, Zero Hedge saying the the leader of uh, Filipinos said um, screw you, um, NATO you know, they're, they're, they're sick of uh, NATO telling them what to do. Uh, actually, it's uh, the United Nations. They're, they're th- thinking oh, about yeah, dropping yeah, out of the I'm United my, Nations. Yeah, yeah it was and, the United Nations, my fault, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I'm not too surprised. I mean, most of the countries of the world who are part of the United Nations have seen in recent years how the U.N. policy is totally dominated by the United States, usually on behalf of uh, Israel. And they're trying to keep the U.N. going because they remember that what one of the things that heralded uh, World War II was the collapse of the League of Nations, which had been put together after World War I. And so uh, a lot of people are saying if the U.N. collapses, uh, that will open the door to a real World War III. And I, I don't think the uh, relationship is that solid. I think we're into World War III already, even with the U.N. I would like to see the U.N. collapse, though. I mean, just for all its purposes. I mean, it hasn't really done anything to uh, benefit the people or the countries. And, you know, it's just more part of the the one world government. Well, I think in theory, something like the United Nations, where differences can be worked out diplomatically and avoid conflict is a good idea. Uh, The problem was the rise of that permanent security council, uh, which basically... You know, the, the five permanent members basically co-opted the U.N. and took it over for their own purposes. And certainly uh, the United States has been misusing their position there to protect uh, Israel's war crimes. And for a lot of people, the fact that the United Nations cannot con- constrain Israel in their constant war crimes uh, is why the U.N. has lost credibility. Not to mention their participation in the Intergovernmental Panel on on climate change and their pushing of global warming and a carbon tax. And, you know, it, it's like the EU. It starts as a good idea and then it rapidly mutates into this cancerous abomination. Yeah, it seems like they're showing the true colors. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad everything's coming out. Um, well, that's all I have to say, Mike. But um, right. thanks for everything. Well, thank you very much for the phone call. We're going to switch over to Andrea in Oklahoma. Aloha, Andrea. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, and I got to do a rejoin. I'm sorry. Before you talk, Andrea, we have to do a shout out to our on air affiliates who are just now rejoining our network. We're taking phone calls in this third hour and just talking about whatever people want to talk about. Except chemtrails and engineering and Bigfoot, those calls are still banned. Andrea, what's on your mind? Yes. Um, after, um, well, anyway, I'm concerned about the election, and I called the state election board and uh, requested or demanded transparency for this November uh, that they 
instead of using the machine, of course, you just fill in the arrow, and then you put it in the machine. And uh, I talked to the head person down at the Capitol, and she assured me. And she invited me down to come look at her machines, that they write all their code, that it doesn't go anywhere, that it's, it's all, it's not, no way it can be rigged. Of course, I brought up Bev Harris and how easily anything that goes into a machine can be manipulated because, you know, out of sight, nobody is, there is no transparency. And we went back and forth, but she, you know, she goes, come down, I'll show you. This is my life business, and I am so sure that, uh, that I can convince you that everything is good here in Oklahoma. Now, when it gets to vaccines, we had a Senator Yin that was determined to pass okay, a Andrea, bill. Andrea, Andrea, hang on a second. I want to back up here. You need to get a copy of the DVD, Hacking Democracy, and send it to this lady, because she sounds like the election worker uh, at the very end of that documentary who broke into tears because she was so convinced these machines could not be cheated, uh, and then she saw with her own eyes how easy it was to do. Uh, so you need to send a copy of that DVD to this election worker. So uh, you wanted to say something about vaccines now. Yes. Um, well, they had a Bill 830 that Senator Yen, which is a do- he was a doctor, has five children of his own, was determined to um, enforce that everybody get vaccines. And there was a Tulsa doctor that went to bat um, against them. Her name was uh, Stephanie Christensen, uh, Christiner, uh, and she went to bat because she took her little girl. Uh, she was getting her first rounds of shots, and she died within uh, a couple of hours after getting all those shots. Yes. Two doctors going up against, uh, you know, going at it. She had more people on her side. And if doctors speak up because they see what's going on, and especially if it's going to happen to their children, there's a chance that, you know, people will wake up faster. But it takes doctors against doctors. I mean, and they they turned down that bill. They, they kicked it out. So um, I just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. Well, that's a good victory here. And uh, uh, the issue, though, is that the vaccines themselves uh, uh, make money for the practitioners. Uh, looking at the HPV shot, uh, it's it's something like a three hundred dollar shot. And the person wielding the needle gets half of that. So they're financially incentivized to stick those needles into those kids. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that the doctors, when they vaccinate their own kids, they're very careful. They don't mix it together, and, you know, they're, they're very... But with the others, it's just, you know, mix it all together and shoot it in. And, yes, a lot of kids are dying from these vaccines, especially when they're mixed together. Uh, and it says on the package insert, can cause infant death. And yet, every time another baby dies immediately after vaccines, they say, oh, the parents killed him with shaken baby syndrome, and they'll throw the parents in jail. Uh, all to protect the profitability of the pharmaceutical corporations. We have descended into total, complete fascism where the corporations have all the power and rights and authority, and we ordinary people, we're just livestock to be harvested from for work product one way or the other. Okay? We've got to do something. We've, and it, it, if doctors see it, hopefully you know, we can you know get rid of them because um, they're no good. And And... Three shots that are, I mean, it's the first two shots that usually kills the girl or totally uh, messes her up for life. So they never get probably to the third shot. (laughs) But anyway. Well, you know, uh, uh, there are some vaccines that do a good job. Let's be very honest. The problem is the pharmaceutical corporations have changed their business model. Uh, They don't want to make medications for people who are actually sick because sick people can die and families can sue for bad products. So the new business model is selling medicines to people who don't actually need it. And uh, like I said, uh, our current pharmaceutical uh, uh, complex, if you will, uh, is operating on the same moral level as the traveling Wild West medicine show salesman. You know, go into town, scream about a pandemic out there on the Great Plains and sell a bunch of totally useless stuff and then ride on out of town with the money. And, and that's exactly how they're operating right now. Okay? Uh, I think you know, we've got to have heart. And, and I, if, it, if somebody has their child that's totally great one day 
and not there the next day. It's going to just be a matter of time. They, what do they have to live for? I wouldn't have, I would be in a nervous, I would be, I would break down. And I, what would be the point of living? And and I think that our, if our government keeps doing it, it's going to hit people like myself if they were to take out their children or grandchildren. It's like they're going to have, there's going to be a breaking point where you can't, like, you well, what we're it. seeing, what we're seeing here, uh, is a crisis of belief because our society uh, has been run like a religion. We are brainwashed as small children to believe certain things uh, and then run our lives on those beliefs. Our government is good. The media is honest. Doctors would never hurt you. Uh, bankers are looking out for the community. Uh, and you know, we're, we're in a situation right now where Americans are looking at all of this and realizing it was all this incredible matrix of lies and people have to be ready to stand up and say doctors are not automatically better people they're driven by the profit margin remember that guy got sent to jail for 45 years for telling his perfectly healthy patients they had cancer so he could sell them chemotherapy and radiation treatments and we need to keep that in mind these practitioners in this medical industrial complex are not there to keep you healthy they're there to make money off of you by making you sick and that's exactly the mindset they have. Anyway, Andrea, I need to let you go. we got a bunch of callers waiting patiently. We're going to switch over to Joel in Wisconsin. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Question. If we have a national security agency with a large annual budget for the purpose of keeping this country secure, my question is how did they happen to miss the accidental leakage that Hillary was putting out information, work-related emails for all those years? Maybe they should be uh, checked into. Well, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who think the NSA did have it all, and they're using it to, uh, to blackmail Hillary Clinton. Uh, there was a story that came out the other day about uh, how the NSA is possibly blackmailing Barack Obama because it's, it's known they were spying on him when he was a senator. But if they didn't stop it in the first place, that's their job. That's what we're told their job is. Uh, but, you know, again, think about the history of the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover. And he turned the FBI's in uh, investigative resources against the political leadership. And he built up his special private files, which was all the dirt he had on the political leaders, including President John F. Kennedy. And that's why he was made FBI director for life. He had the goods on everybody. Hoover used to call his office the seat of the U.S. government because he was calling the shots. And these intelligence agencies historically have had a tendency of arrogating to themselves actual control of the country. Uh, was the CIA uh, certainly leading up to the Bay of Pigs? Today it's the NSA. And they're, they're unelected, they're unimpeachable, they're uh, unaccountable to the American people for what they're doing. And when you're an intelligence agency and you've got the dirt on somebody like Hillary Clinton... Uh, your fortunes are best preserved by keeping it secret and using it to blackmail Hillary for bigger budgets and, and more uh, authority from the other intelligence agencies. Maybe they need more money, and I'm just, I think I'll send them a donation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks an awful lot, Joel. We're going to switch over to Francis in North Carolina. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello. Aloha, Michael. Aloha. Uh, I am so disappointed. Do you know that? That you're going to okay. have to wait and uh, huh? I said, okay. What are you disappointed in? Well, that you, I'm going to have to wait until October for the woo-woo calls about trails and uh, UFOs and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Now, on another well, note. Uh, yeah, okay. On another note, entirely separate. Uh, hey, I had a little humor in there. Come on, get real. Uh, on another note, when you talk about the electronic uh, goodies and how things are going hacked and who knows what, uh, and how cameras and microphones are being utilized, whether you think you have them turned off or not, um, which even for people that have a small business and use a uh, charge processing uh, uh, utility or whatever, and they require that you have all that stuff on during a transaction, which is like, excuse me, didn't need that before. And I could name you a couple for that matter, but I'll leave it alone. My question for you is this. Most anybody this day and time, whenever they're paying for a purchase, either with a debit card or a charge or whatever, at the store, and they got to swipe a card instead of uh, flipping a bill to pay for their order, and they're signing it electronically. Uh, 
Would it not be better to use a different signature to uh, do that transaction in? Because, quite frankly, once they have your electronic signature like that, you can be blackmailed whenever they want. Or they could use your signature to forge documents in your name is the, is the uh, aspect that's out there. Me, I try and do as much of my life in cash as I can, and I'm not committing any criminal offenses. I just don't think the fact that I'm buying a jelly donut is any business of the government to know. Period. <laughs> End of discussion. All right, Francis, i got to let you go. we got more callers waiting on the line after these words from our sponsors. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. Let's go right to the phone lines. James in Ohio, thank you for waiting. What's on your mind? Hi. Um, I was thinking about cryptography. I've spent some time thinking about it, and uh, some big wig from Google said, we know what you're going to type before you do, so I had some suggestions on encryption. Uh, one of the more popular ways for people to communicate with prisoners in prisons is to take a book and pick a num a letter and a or a number uh, character on a particular page and the person in prison has the same book and therefore they have a code key uh, you can send if you're remote from somebody you need to communicate with over the internet you can send it through the mail they may might be able to read everything you send over the internet but good luck reading all the letters sent through the US mail <coughs> Secondly, uh, even if you have a good system for encrypting characters, you're, there are patterns in your speech so that can be recognized by some kind of quasi-artificial intelligence. So I suggest that you throw in syntax from other languages, whereas in English you would say, my children are alive. In uh, Sanskrit you would say, I am alive childed. Uh, third need to get a copy of a thesaurus because they're expecting you to use uh, the usual words get a copy of a book of uh, deprecated terms use old language perhaps from the Victorian era or others and uh, finally <clears throat> a pattern that they no doubt use to break encryption if you remember the show Jeopardy on occasion they would uh, throw up a a puzzle, and they would give them the letters R S T L N E because because those are the most commonly used characters in the English language in that order. So uh, no, E is E is the most common letter used okay. in the English language. Well, I, I wasn't sure about the order, but they would give them R S T L N E, and they would fill those in because those are the most commonly used characters in the language. So. If you can change not only the characters, encrypt not only the characters, but write in a different way, convey information in a creative manner, uh, then... Well, you know, there's a, there's a, there, I mean, that's a lot of uh, old school, and, and when we're kids, we're all played with cryptography. In fact, I was down at uh, uh, a store in the, the mall that actually has a little kid's uh, spy cryptography set with the colored ink and writing with lemon juice and and right. uh, all the rest of that uh, stuff. Uh, but one of the most effective ways of secret messages is called steganography, uh, which yeah. is Im embedding your message in the low order bits of a JPEG. And right. the beauty of the system is if it's also encrypted, uh, they don't even know whether there's a, there's a message there or not. Many, many years ago, one of the uh, images on the original Rancho Runamucca site, uh, I embedded a message in it uh, and said, I dare anybody to find it, and nobody ever did. Uh, and at this point, I've actually forgotten which picture it was. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, you know, if it doesn't look like a message, they're not even going to try and decode it. So there, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. But the, the reality is we have to take responsibility for enforcing that Fourth Amendment because the government will not. And we have a right to privacy, and it doesn't make us a criminal. There are just things in our lives that we don't feel the government has a right to know about, like the jelly donut I'm getting on my way home from work. That's just it. They, they don't have a right to know. And, and we have to stand up for our freedoms. Anyway, James, thank you very much. We're going to let you go, and we're going to start with David in South Carolina. I'm probably going to have to take you through the commercial break. What's on your mind? Hello, Mike. Thank you for taking my call. 
I had two things for you. I was going to wonder if you could address, and I'll take the answers off the air, but um, I've never understood this where the United States, uh, all these allies in the Gulf, everything, they're going, they're so determined for a long time to go after the Shiites, the Alawites in Syria, the Houthis in Yemen, you know, Shiites in Iraq and Iran. The second issue is probably rhetorical, <laughs> but you know, these radical Salafists, you know, ISIS, they never even say a peep about Israel, much less attack them. And uh, I'll take this off the air. Thank you, Mike. All right. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the use of Shiite or Houthi or whatever uh, is part of the smoke screen. The government attacks those people who will not do what the government, the U.S. government demands that they do. And you're right. All of these so-called terror groups, they never attack Israel. Kind of makes you think. Got to take a break for commercial. Back with more phone calls after these few words. And Aloha America, welcome back to the show here. We're going to go to the phones. Uh, apparently we lost Kyle, so let's switch over to John in Barbados. Aloha, John. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Aloha, Michael. Uh, yes, well, I'm looking at some reports from the Pentagon generals uh, <laughs> threatening, threatening Syria and Russia over this bombing of the Kurdish rebels. Now... What you, I mean, there are two groups of, of, of Kurdish rebels, the YPG and the PKK. The PKK are the ones that are fighting Turkey and everybody else to create a uh, Kurdish homeland. But the YPG is actually supporting the Assad government. Guess which one America is supporting? I mean, that's, uh, this is not a trick question, Michael. <laughs> no, I, I didn't think it was here, but, uh, you, you know, it, like I said, the, the U.S., if, you, if you're doing what you're told to do, you'll be left alone. If you're not doing what you're told to do, bad things happen to you. Well, as far as I know now, uh, being as Russia's moved the S-400s into Crimea and the NATO ships floating around in the Black Sea, have got no chance of any real air cover for those little floating targets they call ships. Uh, I mean, this is now uh, becoming, from what I hear of, of the Turkish Prime Minister offering Vladimir Putin the Insulik air base as well, the facilities there, and Iran offering Russia these air bases, uh, the Black Sea will soon become a private Russian lake. Well, under the Montrose Convention, you know, it's supposed to be a private lake for those nations that actually border it. And what the U.S. government was really hoping to do with <clears throat> the overthrow of Ukraine's government was to have the, the new puppet ruler of Ukraine uh, tell Russia to get out of Crimea uh, so that Russia would not be able to uh, uh, be in the Black Sea. And that, of course, obviously did not work out. Uh, and, and so we're seeing this big push. What the U.S. would like to do is find some way uh, to steal Crimea back uh, and deny Russia a presence in the Black Sea, other than, other than under the restrictions of the uh, Montrose Convention. But in this point, uh, it's almost a little late because Syria has now given Russia uh, use of its seaports there in the uh, uh, eastern Mediterranean. And and so it's almost like the U.S. is kind of like a little behind the times as to what's going on. Well, I was I was watching a piece on uh, on uh, crosstalk on Russia Today. You know the 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 uh, discussion program. Yes. Uh, and basically, what what the the guests were saying is that the U.S. foreign policy has gone into reverse. It appears now that most countries, including Yemen, apparently, have now requested Russian help. Yes. Uh, so everything that uh, the Obama administration has done in the Middle East, is it's not turned to gold. He's got the reverse Midas touch. I think it's turned to green cheese. Well, uh, certainly Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, bear the credit for the uh, uh, policy falling apart, but we know that this policy actually began back during the administration of uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, because uh, of uh, 
uh, Wesley Clark blowing the whistle on this whole situation. But you're right. Under Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, all these installed U.S. puppet governments are now realizing their own fortunes are best served pivoting toward Russia. It is a major foreign policy disaster for the U.S. government. And the question is, are they really willing to start a full-on war with Russia and China to try and overcome this, uh, this change? No, I, I think maybe if it looks like Mr. Trump is going to win the election, I think they'll, they'll stick him with a war. Uh, I've been thinking much the same thing, but there's a reason to pull back on that. Uh, Donald Trump is a businessman. Uh, he's less concerned about uh, history and image and reputation and bluff and bluster. And the U.S. war hawks could start a major war, Trump could come on in and say, well, look, that was the last administration. We're starting from fresh here. Let's sit down and settle this whole thing down with Russia and China. And China and Russia would immediately agree uh, to a ceasefire and to end hostilities, and the war hawks would still be out of business, and they would look really bad for having started a war that went nowhere. Right now, we're on the verge of seeing Syria turn into this generation's version of Vietnam, and that's why the U.S. is doing all this chest thumping. They've gone on in and literally taken this swath of Syria and said, this is now our turf, and you're not allowed to come in here anymore. That's an invasion. That's an act of war. And, well, and finally, I just want to make one more point, Mike. Uh, Mike. Yes. All this anti-Russian, anti-Putin rhetoric in the press, the media, and from the Western leaders, is actually counterproductive. If you look what's happening in Europe and in Russia, Putin's popularity is skyrocketing. <laughs> well, it is, but most of the anti-Russian propaganda in the corporate media is aimed at the American people to try and sell them a new Cold War uh, and certainly uh, to try and bolster Hillary Clinton because from now until the election, anything bad that comes out about Hillary Clinton, oh, it's a Russian lie. It's Russian propaganda. Russia is leading Donald Trump. You know, Russia is doing the hacking. Uh, Russia is, you know, stealing socks from your dryer. Uh, you know, Russia is hiding your sunglasses in your car keys. And it's getting very, very tiresome. Uh, and this kind of propaganda would have worked in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, but those days are kind of gone. Our young people have grown up without the public schools brainwashing them to soil themselves when they hear the word Russian, and most of the young Americans today remember it wasn't all that long ago that Russia and China were our friends and trade partners, and they have to be wondering just why all of a sudden are we supposed to believe they're our dire enemies now? Well, I think uh, it, it, it certainly is backfiring big style against... Uh the current administration, and and I think it'll have a negative effect on Hillary Clinton once people realize the difference between Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton. Well, I, the, the question is just how far is the Clinton campaign and the corporate media willing to go to try and convince us Hillary's going to win November's election? When we're already seeing the signs of election fraud in Nevada, and apparently they've caught some uh, in Ohio uh, as well. Are they literally going to say, Hillary won the election, just shut up and sit down, and we're going to kill everybody who doesn't agree with us? Uh, because that <laughs> would signal to the American people, we really are a dictatorship. We have lost control of this country, uh, and the government that sits in Washington, D.C., is neither legal nor legitimate under the Constitution. And any, go any government that wants to enjoy the lawful authority of the American people has to respect and abide by that Constitution. And uh, it's that oath from the president to bear truth, faith, and allegiance to that constitution. They're not allowed well, to just drop that out. I understand, by the way, that your electronic voting machines are stored on military bases. Perhaps if a, uh, a suitable uh, piece of equipment to be used against it is that famous tank of yours, which isn't so good, Maybe it should run round that warehouse like a bull in a china shop. I'm I'm not aware Perhaps that the electronic voting they, machines uh, are stored on military bases. Uh, uh, again, if you go back, okay, uh, hang on a second. Uh, uh, the if you go to the end of the documentary "Hacking Democracy," they show that these machines are kept in a warehouse uh, by the election authority. It's not on a military base. I don't know where you got that, but I don't think it's accurate. Okay, well, 
<laughs> Which doesn't in- mean I don't think it would be a good idea to go in there with a bunch of sledgehammers and kill those things before they steal our nation away from us. But I don't think they're on military bases. Okay, Michael. Anyway, thanks for having me on again. I've been off for a while. I've been painting the yard and the walls against and it. redecorating the house. So there we go. All right, we had some echo there on the back. We're going to let you go, John. Thank you very much here. All righty, getting on back to human-caused global warming. Up in Portland, the Portland Public School Board has voted to ban any and all classroom materials that cast doubt on human-caused global warming. You will believe in human-caused global warming. We don't care what the science actually is. You will believe this. You will believe in human-caused global warming. You will believe government is good. You will believe the media is honest and truthful. Talk about brainwashing. That's exactly what's going on. They're brainwashing our kids not to think, but to believe as they're told to believe. Because that's how you're controlled. When you are growing up, When you are too young to understand that the big people are full of crud, that's when they give you the things you believe in and your personality grows up around those beliefs. And it takes a supreme effort of will to break free of those slave chains made out of beliefs. But it can be done. It's a little disorienting, but it can be done and it should be done. Because beliefs are the chains that hold free minds enslaved. No chains of steel or iron ever bound a human being tighter than the chains made of the beliefs we're indoctrinated with as little children. That's how the nation, that's how the government rules you. It's not a business, it's not even a government, it's just another religion. Like the religion of banking. Arbitrary rules you believe in and think represent something real. And that's how the rulers continue to rule you. Now, getting on back to uh, human-caused global warming, uh, apparently President Obama understands that confidence and trust in human-caused global warming is eroding rapidly, especially after several record-setting winters, and according to the old Farmer's Almanac, another one on the way. So what do you do when you're caught out lying? Well, you up the budget for the liars. Obama is now cutting the budget for the planned NASA probe of Jupiter's moon Europa, where they hope to drill down and and find life in, in the water there, in order to fund NASA for more global warming research. We're just going to give NASA, which stands for Never a Straight Answer, more and more money to come up with fancy graphs and charts to say, oh, yes, the world is warming, and it's all the fault of you humans. Absolutely nothing else controls climate on Earth except you human beings, and you will atone for your sins against Mother Earth with carbon taxes and obedience to an environmental authority. Now, the reality is actually quite different. Climate on Earth is controlled by many, many factors, some more powerful than others. Do humans have an impact on the environment? Yes. Is it significant? Not really. Climate on Earth is determined by two primary mechanisms. The first is the level of solar output, how much energy is coming from the sun, and it is not a constant. There are multiple overlapping cycles of solar activity. There's the 11-year sunspot cycle, the 22-year magnetic cycle. Now they're beginning to get indications of longer cycles of 60 and 90 years. And the indications are that a lot of these cycles are going to all hit their low points together over the next decade and bring with it a repeat of the Little Ice Age and the Maunder Minimum. The second factor that controls climate on Earth is the shape of the Earth's orbit, which oscillates from circular to elliptical and back again over roughly 100,000-year cycles. When the Earth's orbit is elliptical, the Earth spends more time at the far end of the ellipse following Kepler's laws of orbital motion. The Earth cools, we get the ice ages. When the orbit returns to circular... The Earth spends more time closer to the sun, we get the interglacials, which is where we are right now. So until the Carbonazis can 
control solar output or shift the Earth in its orbit. There isn't a thing they can do to change climate change. Not one thing. This is just creating a crisis out of thin air, taking something that happens naturally, like climate change, declaring it an emergency and a crisis, and using it to obtain your money and more power over you. That's it. That's really what it is. And it's a big, huge conspiracy. Anybody who says there's no such thing as large government conspiracies, we've got one staked out on the ground for you to study and learn from. This one involved NASA. It involved NOAA. It involved the Australian Meteorological Association, the New Zealand Meteorological Association. It involved the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It involved the Hadley Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. It involved Penn State. All the government had to do was say the funding is going out to those who will document human-caused global warming, and the scientists said, I will, I will. I'll prove humans are warming the earth. Give me the money. And that's how the science got bought, because individual scientists are just as easy to corrupt as individual politicians and individual clergy. The best defense against that, whether it's human-caused global warming or vaccines are safe or GMOs are good for you, is for you to become your own scientist. Know enough about science or be able to do the research and find out for yourself what's going on. All right, we're going to take another phone call here. Richard in New York, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey. Oh, they lost me? You're on the air. Hey, how are you? No, I'm I just fine. wanted to say this. I, I knew Michael Jackson as a little kid, knowing growing up with him, and my parents were very friendly with their parents and tried to sell them property in New York, which they couldn't buy in Old Westbury. And there's no way that you could say that he was sexually exploitive of children, a lot of that was rumors that they used against him. And it, 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 just to say that as an offhanded comment, I found it, you know, horrible. Well, I you know, I, I really don't want to go into that part of it. I mean, I like to make a joke about uh, Michael Jackson and I having the same birthday uh, and what it means for astrology. Uh, but I actually did work with Michael Jackson on one of his earlier videos uh, for the Jackson 5, it was called uh, Can You Feel It? And uh, I remember he struck me as being this incredible lonely person because he was surrounded by all these enablers who were making money off of him, and they didn't want anybody coming in and spoiling the party. And I think that little Neverland amusement park he built in his home was an attempt to go back and actually have something resembling a normal childhood. Now, th that, being, that being said, it doesn't excuse some of what was going on with the little boys. We're going to have to let you go. We've got to take a commercial break. Sure Thank you very much Michael. for the phone call, and we'll be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to our show. Last segment of the program today, and looking back and, and, and summing up what we've been seeing uh, over this election season, we know this is the crookedest election in U.S. history. There is ample evidence of fraud during the primaries. Apparently, Guccifer 2.0 has just uh, leaked some more emails talking about uh, possible election fraud that was going on in uh, Pennsylvania. Hillary Clinton is now declaring war on the independent media because she doesn't like it, that she can't just tell you what to believe and have you believe it. Because that's what worked before. You'll believe what the government and the media tell you when you will act accordingly. Well, that doesn't work anymore. And that is a real problem for those who are trying to hang on to power or to start wars. And that is really what is the ultimate issue here. The current entrenched establishment loves war. They make money off of war. They gain authority over the people with war. And they don't see that the United States is not able to prevail in this next one. They're resting on this assumption that the U.S. never loses a war, not counting Vietnam. And they're not willing to look honestly at the current state of the nation in terms of the economic fortitude to sustain a war, our manufacturing to produce the sheer volume of war material that a war needs. 
We don't have the manpower. And more importantly, the military rank and file and the civilian population do not believe in the moral rightness of any of these wars. And that means we're not willing to go to the extremes it takes to prevail. We have far too many people in Washington, D.C. who are not thinking clearly. Whether it's the lead in the water, the prescription antidepressants, blood clots on the brain. Their thinking is very short-sighted. End of the election cycle, end of the term in office making our particular donors and handlers happy, and that's it. There doesn't seem to be anybody maintaining an overview of what's really best for the nation as a whole, and that ultimately is supposed to be the president's job. And the last several presidents we've had have failed at it miserably. They're there to please their their backers, their supporters, their blackmailers. And this nation cannot survive a continuance of that form of government and that's why it's important for all of us to be supporting donald trump and it's not really an issue of whether you have reasons to vote for donald trump it's thinking about all those reasons you have to vote against hillary clinton and that's what it's going to come down to we're going to see americans flock to the polls in november not to vote for donald trump but to vote against hillary clinton to keep her and the narcocracy from one more cycle in that White House. There's the music. Time for me to get on out of here and do Jim Goddard's show up in Vancouver. We'll be back tomorrow here on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Until then, stay safe, stay informed, stay skeptical, make good choices. All of you out there listening to my voice, you are now part of the independent media that Hillary Clinton hates so much. Go on out and share your information with everybody that you can. We'll be back tomorrow. Aloha, America. 